uh, Michael, I didn't know you were coming here. Nice to see you. Uh, that's hey, Michael and hey. Jim. Hi, Michael and Jim. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Stacy's here too somewhere. She'll be oh. in. Hello, Stacy <laughs> and Alfie. Alfie is their dog. He's behind Alfie, Michael yeah. on the couch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got a whole crowd. Hey, Bart. Hey, how are you, Lens? Doing well, how are you? Excellent, good luck, Ken. Thank you, nice to meet you, not just on Facebook. You bet. <laughs> Hi, Tracy. Hi again. Hi, Bart. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are here at Kenneth Bobo's book launch event for Lilac and Sawdust. And if you don't mean to be here, then you have stumbled across quite a lucky thing. But we're glad you're here. <laughs> And we are going to hear some poetry. We're gonna talk, um, it's going to be very casual and fun. We are just here spreading the love with Ken. I am Lindsay Garcia, Metal Lark Press's publicist, and I will be your host tonight. We also have Tracy Million Simmons here, our publisher. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> and of course, our poet of the night, Kenan. This book was chosen as a finalist to the Birdie Poetry Prize that Metal Lark Press hosts annually. So that is quite the feat, Kenneth. Congratulations on that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kenneth and this collection, and then we will have him read some poems, and then we'll chat afterwards. Sound good? Kenneth Pobo is the author of 21 chapbooks, and as we discussed right before we let you all in, 11 full-length poetry collections. Recent books include Bend of Quiet, Lop Lop in a Red City, Dindy Expecting Snow, Wing Buds, and Uneven Stephen. In addition to welcoming Lilac and Sawdust into the world, he has another full-length collection, Opening, Forthcoming, and he also has a forthcoming chapbook, too. Human rights issues, especially as they relate to the LGBTQIA community, are also a constant presence in Kenneth's work. In addition to poetry, he also writes fiction and essays. For the past 30 years, he taught at Widener University and retired last year. The Kansas Poet Laureate Waskar Medina picked this manuscript as the finalist for the Birdie Poetry Prize and commented, I believe you should try to secure publishing rights to Lilac and Sawdust. It's rich, compelling, and romantic. And Waskar's right. I have never read anything like this book. And I am proud to have you join the Metal Art family, Ken. This book absolutely shows many extraordinary glints in Jeff and Jerry's individual lives and their shared life. They're compelling characters whose personalities are so well developed throughout the collection. We want to laugh and cry and observe alongside them. We want to sing, I think we're alone now with Jerry. <laughs> we want to know these people and we get to through Ken's craft. Ken, thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Lindsay, and of course, thank you, Tracy, as well. Uh, and thank everybody at Meadowlark uh, for making the book possible. Let me just say a couple words about the book before reading it, because maybe it needs just a little bit of a context. Jeff and Jerry are two gay men, and they're married. And uh, like any couple, sometimes they fight, sometimes they love, sometimes they question, sometimes there's a lot of looking back into what made them the people that they are. Uh, I don't know that I was uh, as successful as I would have liked to have been in terms of the many tones that go through a life. You know, I, part of me wanted them to be humorous, part of me wanted them to be serious, uh, political, all, all sorts of different things that uh, kind of join together uh, to form kind of a pattern of kinds, I think, uh, for the book. At least that was kind of my goal as I began to write it. But at first, I did not think that this was going to be a book. You know, I had Jeff and I had Jerry, and I started writing poems, and one poem kind of led like a railroad depot to the next depot and then to the next after that. And before you know it, like, I'm getting into these guys, you know, and uh, if I wrote about one that kind of stimulated a poem by the other before you know it, you got a book. <laughs> it maybe wasn't meant to be that way at first, but I, I think that's part of the creative process 
what we may start out doing may be very different after we work on it for a while and the project takes on its own kind of surprises and dimensions along the way. So that's kind of how the book kind of came about here. I'd like to open tonight with uh, the first poem in the book, actually, a kind of a reflective poem. Jeff and Jerry were older, in their 40s when they met. The creek had widened like their bellies. Time felt a bit shorter, a bit faster. Sex was like falling into a hammock after mowing the lawn, lulling and pleasant. They had little in common, though a bluebird's blue return in April drew them both to the window. They never go to clubs, hardly go out to eat, the everybody loves Raymond marathon too tempting. The propane heater's soft blue flicker warms the room, legs touch. Night like a porch with a light suddenly turned on. When I think about uh, relationships, uh, and this doesn't necessarily just apply to uh, romantic relationships, but uh, friendships, uh, family relationships sometimes, uh, I often feel that maybe we're often uh, in a state of migration. I don't know that we can ever say, well, this is where we are and that's how it's going to stay. Life doesn't seem to work that way. So the next poem I'd like to share with you is a poem called Migrations and about the changes uh, in their lives that they encounter. Migrations. Before Jerry met Jeff, he had decided that love was a coat rack and he had no coat. Jeff had stacked up his affairs like dirty plates, a fairly messy life. They met in a line at Walmart. In that rocky first year, they argued about cabinets. Jerry wanted open spaces, nothing stacked. Jeff rarely threw anything away. The dining room table grew heaps of newspapers. Once Jerry tried to toss them out, but Jeff snarled, I was saving those for the sports sections. The games are over. Try reading Twain instead. They love birds. Jeff watches them on the shore or flying when he goes fishing. Jerry never fishes. He stays in the cabin with the binoculars watching loons dart underwater. Jeff gets up by 4.30 to catch the first nibbles. When Jerry wakes up, he finds the coffee already made, Melita coffee, a low burning fire, a plate mountain in the sink. You can't have everything. You drink the coffee, see the boat through the binoculars and drift like a ripple. By the way, <laughs> some of the things uh, in the book do resemble elements of my own personal life. Uh, Stanley and I do drink the Melita coffee. <laughs> so there are things that, you know, kind of swim from the personal that uh, make it into uh, the uh, private sphere of uh, Jeff and Jerry here. Uh, this next one is, uh, I think for me, one of the more painful poems that I ended up writing for the book. Uh, I think for many uh, LGBTQ plus people, there's always the fear of attack. There's always the fear of people that are going to come after you or your house or anything like that. And I didn't feel I could write the book fairly without reflecting on that very real fear, which frankly I feel is getting worse nowadays than getting better, uh, as much as we would like to think that uh, maybe that's not the case. So this poem I'd like to share with you, it's called, Jeff and Jerry wake up one Saturday and find spray painted on their white garage door, faggots. Well, it means faggots, but it's spelled F-A-G-O-T-S. Any number of people could have done it. A nice neighborhood, lawns dutifully mowed, no loud parties, even on weekends. Nice. And notes stuffed in the mailbox that say, we're gonna get you. Perhaps they will get them someday. They've alerted the police. Jerry remembers when he was robbed years before he moved in with Jeff, how the missing TV ended up on a clipboard in the patrol car, never even turned in. That's what the secretary said at the station. Help may come, 
or not. Either way, the garage needs repainting. Tomorrow pops up wearing torn fatigues. The next message may be written in blood. Here in southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, I don't know about where everybody lives and what your uh, stores are, but uh, one of the major stores we have around uh, where we live uh, just south of Philadelphia is CVS. It, it's a drug store. It's a pharmacy. There's loads of them around, uh, so you almost can't escape them. Uh, th this is a poem from Jeff's point of view here. It's Jeff sees his old church is a CVS. From age seven, I sang in the choir. Mrs. Selke taught me how to get notes to fall just right. I got solos. Deacon Pinter said he wished every boy would be like me. Maybe I didn't look gay. He'd have kicked my ass in a most unholy way, as they all would, long ago. At work, I make up tunes I hum silently. A few I share with Jerry, who once egged me on to audition for Dancing with the Stars. I dance too. Today, the Bible Church of Tibbs Ford is a drive through CVS. We get bagged drugs while eating McDonald's fries. Pills, a small blue choir in a bottle. We swell with praise, forget what we're praising. This next poem is called Page 234. In books he read on the sly at the library, the few that mentioned homosexuality, except in a nasty or stupid way, he learned that gay men are distant from their fathers, a great truth on page 234 in a book written by a doctor. Jeff enjoyed his dad, who played softball, helped him with geometry problems, watched reruns of Rocky and Bullwinkle. What distance? It took years for Jeff to take a cigarette lighter and burn the doctor's book. Burn it right up, every word. Not the real book. He hadn't gone to that library in years, but the one inside his head where the doctor prescribed pills made of lies made him swallow. I'd like you right now to uh, go back, way back in time maybe for many of you, and think of the first time you really had feelings for another person. And I, I mean kind of romantic feelings. And maybe when we're very young, we don't even have language yet for that, but we know the feeling is very intense and hard to put out of your mind or your heart that way. And this is a poem about that experience that Jerry had. The poem is called Hose. Jerry fell in love for the first time in college. Bill Ainsley a mechanical engineering major. Numbers it were his favorite garden. Strange blossoms opened there. Bill didn't want anyone to know. Jerry wanted everyone to know. They told no one. Bill graduated and moved to Louisville. Promises scorched envelopes. Love water dripping out of a hose rolled up for the winter. The drops becoming fewer than none door locked. Jeff and his work buddies head to Bob's Tap after work. They all know Jeff is married to Jerry. They're cool with it, but sometimes Carl says, I'm trying to remember a song from I Think Cats. Jeff, you'd know it. You guys love show tunes. Jeff, more Led Zeppelin and Joan Jett, orders another picture, talks about the Brewers, another closet Jeff wants to pop out of. A Yankees fan, he starts his day with sports scores, takes it personally when they lose. Closets, he thinks, get so deep that one leads to another. You wander, door locked. All right, I'm going to confess something here. Uh, I don't know how many of you are baseball fans, but the thing about, oh, yeah. <laughs> But the thing about the closet and baseball is definitely about me. Uh, I am a Yankees fan. Uh, when I was growing up, 
I grew up near Chicago. This was some closet I could never admit to my friends. Uh, they were all Cubs and some were White Sox fans, but like, oh my gosh, uh, to be a Yankees fan in Chicago is, is like asking uh, to get your throat cut. <laughs> and then I, you know, I moved to eventually into Philadelphia. Well, in Philly, we're the Phillies, you know, and here I am uh, with my, uh, still my Yankees fans. I'm anything if, if I'm not loyal though, I've been supporting the Yankees since I was 12 years old. I'm 67, uh, do the math, that's a lot of years. But I think when I wrote that poem, that image of being a closeted fan of a team that you can't even admit that, uh, it almost becomes emblematic of the closet itself. All the many ways, whether you're gay or not, by the way, that we may feel closeted about things we feel we can't talk about or we'll be judged, we'll be looked on as like, that's not cool, you shouldn't be that way. This one is called Gunfire Buddha. Jeff put a statue of Buddha on top of the freezer. Buddha looks happy despite a wet cat litter smell. Jeff mostly avoids religion, makes an exception for Buddha. Full of mountains and lotuses, Jerry would like Buddha on Facebook, but would prefer him placed elsewhere. The freezer top already holds eight rolls of paper towels, three batteries, five novena candles, and one vase that looks uglier each year, but Jeff's grandmother willed it to him. Maybe Buddha blesses where a gum pop could be gunfire. I think travel is a way how people travel together or how sometimes people, even who are very close to each other, may do better traveling apart. Traveling is its own kind of separate reality. So I have a few poems in the book about uh, contemplating travel. Here's Jeff and Jerry on separate vacations. Jeff flies to Las Vegas. Desert ice sculptures thrive like cacti. Jerry visits Madeline Island, which publishes a newspaper made of snow, builds a house from icicles. Back home, when Jeff goes to Randy's sports bar, Jeff slips into bed and a book on Tudor England, loves peace and heads rolling. Next year, they'll travel together, seeking a moment when, in a rowboat, the sun frog leaps under a lily pad. This next poem, it's another travel piece here, uh, is something that I, I'm letting Jeff and Jerry do that I've never done. In North Dakota, there's something called the International Peace Garden. And it's kind of between Canada and the United States as a kind of reminder of, I think, the best we want is to have maybe a more peaceful kind of world. And I put Jerry and Jeff as visitors at the Peace Garden. Uh, one thing about uh, if you're a writer, the, at least uh, I found I had to do for this book uh, and all my books really is research. You know, it's one thing to say, I've heard of the Peace Garden, but you know, I, what do I really know about it? So I had to go and kind of read that, but that was kind of cool reading. I enjoyed finding out about the Peace Garden. And that's where this poem comes from. Jerry and Jeff at the International Peace Garden. A garden from 1932. 150,000 flowers planted every summer. Peace ought to bloom loudly in this quiet. Many people right now would kill Jeff and me for being gay. If they kill us here, our graves will have flowers aplenty. We hold hands. Joy sounds mournful like a lake loom. We wait for that sound. We count on it. Missing each other. Jerry slops around in sweatpants and a tee. Jeff fishes in Wisconsin by himself, a trip he makes once a year despite mosquitoes. Jerry uses their parting for movies. He's already, already watched eight Barbara Stanwyck films, topping them off with double indemnity. Now it's time for the Kingfisher Illustrated Horse and Pony Encyclopedia. Not that he likes horses much, but any encyclopedia is a salmon dahlia almost open when you're alone. He learns how to soak a hay nut, what exercises to do in the saddle. He's never even been on a pony. When Jeff returns, Jerry will explain the ways of horses. Jeff will harumph that the fish weren't biting a conversation speeding in opposite directions 
canter and bait. When you think about whatever dwelling, if you live in an apartment or you live in a house or wh wherever you live, isn't it annoying in early, uh, kind of like early summer, if you get ants? Sometimes we get ants and you just try to get rid of them. You know, you keep going boom, 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 and you get as many as you can. It seems like there are still more that march in their way uh, into your dwelling. So I thought I'd write a poem about that, but I'll give the ants to Jeff and Jerry. Jeff smashes them between his fingers. Even as a boy, he'd hose down their colonies, a pretend game of flood. Jerry prefers lightly sweeping them onto a cake plate and putting them outdoors. Who are they hurting? Why kill when they're only guilty of coming inside? They enter as if invited. When Jeff pinches another one to death, Jerry winces, begins to side with the ants almost. Jeff is usually gentle. When Jerry had pneumonia, Jeff fed him soup and fluffed his pillows. He joined Earth Justice. Jerry wonders if his own cruelty hides under one of his ribs, ready to spring loose. He can say things that wound for years. The ants, feisty little things, carry a sugar crumb across a kitchen floor's desert. One thing uh, about my own life, and, and my husband as well, Stanley, we're both gardeners. And one of the things that is, I think, really frustrating for me is the end of October and into November where you know you got to leave a whole lot of things outdoors and winter's going to kill them. If you would come into our house you'd see our bay window has a sill that is just loaded with plants that I just couldn't bear to get rid of. Uh, this poem is called Indoor Garden. As winter sprints near the driveway, Jerry lugs in fuchsias, a plumeria, an abutilon, a waist-high gardenia for a warm bay window, transfers a double-flowered Christmas cactus to the dining room window. Buds look like people standing in a crowded elevator, no hope of the door opening soon. Snow makes the window ache. Colors tremble on the sill. Magic. Jerry waits for magic, leaves on the porch light in case it should pop in at night. Jeff does what he can, but the house still needs cleaning, the lawn mowing. Jeff shrugs off magic, scrambles eggs, and if it's sunny, he'll wash the car. Jerry thinks today the talking goldfish will appear, even for an afternoon, even for a single minute ringed with gold and stretching all the way past the grave. I'm going to read this poem because I heard that uh, Sears Roebuck, that the whole chain is closed and that there's only one Sears store that's left. Uh, when I was growing up, Sears was just part of what was in people's towns. There were so many of, even when Stanley and I got this house and we moved here, we got our appliances at Sears. So I have a kind of sad feeling that Sears, you know, why is Sears going? And why is it being replaced by Home Depot and Lowe's? <laughs> like the old stores leave and the new ones take over. Anyways, wood blocks. Sometimes Jeff gets furious from selling Sears appliances. He comes home and stares at the walls. Jerry has stopped asking, can I get you anything? Jeff needs a tube of quiet, nothing more. Sometimes he walks into the basement, puts wood blocks in a vise, and saws them wafer thin, a form of communion with crickets that sometimes dart out from behind the dryer. What to do with 50 or more thin wood pieces? Use them for poker chips? They end up as kindling. He comes upstairs, hugs Jerry, who is busy making a key lime pie, which will flop again. Jeff is ready to talk about their days. Bits of wood in his collar, the fire slowly taking off. This is called, Jerry says that being gay is like going to heaven and God gives you the mansion right next door to Judy Garland's. She'll sing if you ask her to, which of course you do. She stands by the piano. Millions join in. God joins in too, a little off key. 
I'm old enough that I remember when President Kennedy was assassinated. And, you know, I was in a class in grade school and they wheeled in a television set and we watched for a half hour uh, the news come in that he wasn't just wounded, but that he was killed. I didn't even know back then in fourth grade what had really happened. The news guy kept saying, uh, the president has been assassinated. And I thought that doesn't sound good, but I don't know what that word means. Uh, and November 22nd, 1963 will always be a mark in my consciousness. It just will be until the end. This is called Jerry Puzzles. Dad kept the Chicago Tribune dated November 22nd, 1963, yellow paper like old skin. I'd be born 15 years later. Mom said that America rotted after JFK died. Dad said it would have been better had Nixon won. I haven't saved a single paper. News, a dried up lake. I'm a deer bolting onto the road, scared of any direction. Everything true and false at the same time. Dad says, count on a gun. Mom says, count on nothing. She may be right. The way a Sudoku gets solved if you're logical enough. I'm not. Puzzles sneak up behind me. I can't outrun them. You know, one thing that this reading has done for me that I didn't really expect to have happen is, you know, I know the poems in the book, but when you read a bunch of them out loud, the characters are not on the page anymore. It's like I'm sitting here in my weird little office uh, in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and I feel like right next to me, uh, well, I've got cats actually down on the floor, but right next to me are Jeff on one side and Jerry on the other. They feel like uh, they have kind of rebirthed themselves uh, through uh, being vocalized here as well. Jeff and Jerry sit on the couch after a long day. Silence, beautiful in its way, like a glass filled with artificial snow, shaken. Or a horse that lies down in a field. Some days it's best to send words out to play, the world slipping into pajamas and going to sleep. Thanks everybody for listening. I enjoyed that a lot. I just love the way you read them. I love the way you capture the tone that, you know, you have such a variety of tones that you don't read them all the same. You match the tone of the poem and I appreciate that. There's something that is called poet voice that it, it, it goes like this. And I went to the store and I bought crackers. <laughs> if I read those Jeff and Jerry poems like that, I don't think anyone would stay on. <laughs> and Tracy says, hearing your voice, I have to go read the book again to hear the poems in your voice. So that will be fun to read the book and hear you with it this time. So I just wanted to know um, your teaching. And I know your university. I know Widener. Oh, my. Good. Well, remember, uh, you got a Yankees fan here from New Jersey. <laughs> Some of my colleagues are Yankees fans. Many of them are not. Uh, I imagine so. Um, so just how your teaching has affected your poetry over the years, and especially in the time that you have retired, has that changed certain ways that you write? And obviously the time that you have to life to invite your soul? I feel it, it does. Here's one reason, if, especially if you teach English and creative writing, that, that, that was what I taught. And, you know, to do that, you always have to be reading. And I discovered so many books through teaching. And better yet, it wasn't just, you know, reading the book you know, like, like you can do that and it's a, a private or a quiet kind of thing. But then you go into a classroom and you start talking with the students about it. And someone will say something and it's like something you hadn't thought of before. And it's like suddenly you walk in there and you think I'm all prepared for this class and you're not. <laughs> the student will say something and it's like, ooh, maybe I better rethink that. 
but the cool thing is through the conversations about the the writing that we look at um I, I think that does leave a lasting impression. When you go back, I, I, by the way, where I'm sitting is where I work. Uh, if I showed you, there's my keyboard, you know, this is right where I write, uh, as I did when I, I taught as well. Um, and I, I think this kind of, also I'd say this about my friends at school too, you know, we would always, it's not so easy now that COVID's, you know, made it harder for people to be, together in the same way. But the conversations that were about literature and about books, once people are talking that way, that goes inside you. And when you're getting ready to write, you know, you've got that as kind of something to draw on. Um, I taught a class in uh, literature uh, uh, of uh, kind of the, well, I don't like the phrase non-Western, but uh, literature from Asia in particular. And I got to study, uh, for example, poets from China, from the Tang Dynasty, from the Song Dynasty. And, you know, discovering them, I couldn't wait to get home and write something. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, look what these poets did over a thousand years ago. I got to get up with the group here, <laughs> you know? And, and so in that way, I, I, would, I would say I was influenced. And I would say that was very much in a positive way. One way that it was not a positive way was the G word was grading. You know, I would, if you grade and, you know, you have four sets of papers, that blocks out, for me, other people are much better at this than I am, or I'm retired, so I should say we're much better. But it takes chunks out of my creativity. You know, you're dealing with other people's language over and over again. I feel like sometimes there was kind of an erasure that that does, at least until you can kind of get your sustenance back and, and be able to write. But yeah, that, that part was a little more difficult or challenging in terms of uh, teaching's influence on my writing. Uh, the second part of your question, Bart, uh, is, is more about up to date, is, is about now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that retirement so far, it's only been a year and a half, retirement has been a real boon for uh, my writing. And the reason uh, I don't think would be surprising to practically anyone is I have blocked time and I can write not just like, oh, I got to get to class. I got to get to a meeting. I got to, got to, got to, I got to do this. Most days, not all days, but most days I have the freedom to like, you know, I feel like I can write now and I can go to my desk and I can do it. And I love that kind of freedom. Um, you can see a little bit behind me, the mess that I have. You can see the, uh, well, if I get out of your way, you can see some of my DVDs and you can see some of my CDs. I've got things in the office that I can rely on uh, to kind of jumpstart the engine if I need them. You know, sometimes uh, by watching uh, a film or by listening to music, that can stimulate me too, to be able to want to write something. Um, one thing that I found so far, I hope this remains to be the same uh, as the years go by, uh, is I have not felt writer's block, not at all. Uh, I feel like this has been a very fertile time. That doesn't mean when I sit down and I write, uh, always good stuff happens. A lot of times, you should see me, my good friend is the delete key, you know, <laughs> poems that just don't work out. But I'm grateful to having tried them because, you know, you never know when even a poem that doesn't work is going to lead on. It's like a bridge or a doorway to something else. So whether it works or not is, is really not uh, a painful thing for me that way. But so far anyways, fingers crossed, uh, retirement seems to be a, a, a kind of fertile time for me as a writer. I am curious about uh, following these two characters specifically. Have you done this before? The, uh, Jeff and Jerry are not the first character poems that I've done. Uh, the book that I had on a shore press uh, called Uneven Stephen, that, that's uh, a portrait of one person. I mean, he's got people in his life, but uh, it's still uh, one person. And that's a full length collection too. I like writing about others. And it's interesting how when you invent characters in poetry, uh, how you, 
moments when your own life and moments when your own self do seem to creep in. I almost feel like all of my characters resemble me and don't resemble me at the same time. The, the, those two realities can exist, uh, coexist at the same moment. Sometimes characters uh, that I've created surprise me. Uh, I have a chapbook that's called um, Trina and the Light. And it's about this woman who, she's not in a great marriage, she has two kids. Uh, and when I started writing the book, I was gonna really do a satire. And when I started writing about her, I kind of was writing about her as a figure of fun. You know, uh, uh, somebody who, you know, has trouble uh, with the shopping cart in, in, in the grocery store and ha ha and all of this. Well, I noticed that three to four poems, or I should say drafts, three to four drafts about Trina in, I started liking her. And it, I didn't want to ha ha joke. You know, it's like, this is not a person. She's like me or, or you or anybody. She's got problems. She's got things that are hard. She's got a, a history in her life that isn't easy. Well, why am I going to sit there and for whatever poems I write about this person's life, it, it would seem cruel or if not even just cruel, unjust, you know, to create her as just being a figure of fun. And so when I started Trina in the Light, that turned 360 degrees around from what I thought it was going to be. But I will say this, isn't that one of the coolest things about writing you know uh, you know what what is the line and I can't even remember who said it no surprise for the writer no surprise for the reader and I kind of feel like that that's what happens as we create things we may have it at the beginning in our mind I'm going to write this poem and it's going to be you know about this well maybe it starts out that way and I'm an inveterate reviser mainly because if I don't revise, there's a lot of, I think my language is naturally gassy <laughs> and I need to kind of, you know, shape it so that, you know, it, there, there's much more clarity. And the only way I can do that uh, is, is through revision. Uh, there are, most of my poems do seem to require uh, significant work that way as well. Um, but yeah, and in the revision process, that's surprise too, because things that I thought, oh man, it's in this stanza, that's where the poem really is. As I revise, I feel like, no, it isn't. What you're getting toward maybe near the end is really where you wanna investigate. And you feel like, well, I gotta kinda go back to the drawing board a little bit here to be able to see the poem in a fresh way. I was just gonna say for, for Ken, you might enjoy this. Of course, I got to know uh, the poetry and the book um, long before I got to know you. And I, I remember at one point working on the manuscript and um, there's Jeff and there's Sherry and I'm working on the book and I'm like, who's Ken? Like, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, I know Jeff, I know Jerry, who's Ken? <laughs> and it, it, I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I started asking myself that when I was about three. <laughs> And now I'm 67, still asking, you know. Well, the characters were very real to me. I can, I can see them sitting there too with you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that, 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 that for a writer, that, that's a, a high compliment. You want them to feel, or at least I want them to feel real and not just um, kind of phonied up or just invented, but there's nothing behind them. No story, no real story. It has been a pleasure working on this book and getting to know you. I'd like to say congratulations to Ken. Thank you, Nula. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Ken and I have known each other since we were like 18 or 19. Um, we've been in many workshops together. I'm sitting, uh, I'm not on Zoom, but I am listening in with a big smile on my face. <laughs> and I'm so uh, happy to be part of all of this and to... Um, be at this poetry reading. Thank you for publishing his book. I think it should win the Pulitzer Prize myself. <laughs> I think it's a really brilliant book. And um, I'm just so glad to hear your voice, Ken. Thank you. 
No, thank you. Thank you for those comments too. Uh, Nula's right about that. Uh, we met in college, you know, and uh, I, we won't do the math. <laughs> Let's just say it was a while ago. <laughs> but it, it just kind of shows you, you know, uh, it's incredible how certain friendships can have the uh, capability of enduring that way. We're glad we can be friends with him now too. <laughs> Well, Meadowlark strikes me, Bart, maybe you feel this way a little bit too, since Meadowlark did your book as well. Uh, I don't want to say this, and it's going to sound sentimental, but I, I, I am going to say, Meadowlark feels more like a family. I mean that in the nice sense, you know, um, it feels more personal than some presses do, uh, and that people are able to talk and enjoy and uh, Tracy and, and Lindsay, I will say this, it seemed like when you took on my book, you took it on with a kind of love, you know, I mean, maybe love for reading, love for literature, but also love for this particular book. And as a writer, I felt that, you know, even if we're only looking at each other through boxes on Zoom, you know, <laughs> I felt that kind of uh, connection that came through with Meadowlark. And I do, I want to say right now, I want to say how much I appreciate that. That I've makes me so happy. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I talk about you all as family, so um, <laughs> I'm glad you feel it too. Yeah, that's one of the first things I expressed to Lindsay and to Tracy that uh, um, it's a nest. It seems as if, uh, yeah, it, it's it's just wonderful. And your work is, is uh, your work, my work, I think is stroked by the press and you feel as if uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a place, it's a sweet place you wanna stay. I think that's the best way of, of, of putting it. But having, having dealt with other presses, yeah, it, there is definitely a, definitely a familial aspect and you feel that your work is, uh, is, is, is treasured. That's a good way of putting it, I think. That there's something about it that they recognize. And it's so nice to be able to have that kindred spirit, both with Lindsay and, and, and with Tracy. So uh, I, I, get, I get you, Ken. <laughs> I, get, I get you loud and clear. Well, I it really think... means the world to us. Yeah. It really does. We do love you. We really do. And <laughs> books. And we can say that with all pride and honesty. Well, folks, I think this has been quite a successful book launch event, and I'm so grateful that we were able to share it together. Go find the book on our website or order it through your favorite local bookstore. Um, it's also available on Amazon. Have a wonderful night, everyone. And thanks, King. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you very much.